Have you ever experienced the glazed eyeball syndrome? You know when you're attempting to explain something to someone, your friend, your husband, your boss, your kid, and they're just not getting it? Anyone ever experienced that? I have too. A few times, in fact. But there was this one particular time that when I experienced it, it took me on a new path. And it's profoundly changed the way that I work, the way I play, and the way that I educate others. So about five years ago, I was leading a training with a group of leaders from a range of different industries, and I could feel the energy in the room was split. On this one side, people were mesmerized and captivated and so enthralled, geeking out on systems, processes, all this real-time data. And then there was the other half. And I could see out of the corner of my eye, two people in the back having this private chat, completely oblivious to the content I was sharing with the room. And as I'm walking towards them, I see this woman on the end of the aisle, and she's checking Facebook, thinking, oh, God, this is not good. And this glazed eyeball thing was just hitting me from multiple directions. So I talk to people afterwards, and I get comments like, that training was really hard, that was stressful, that pushed me outside of my comfort zone, or my favorite, that's just not my thing, which is corporate code for I'm bored. My heart sank at the disconnection and the disengagement that they were experiencing. And I left that day feeling more than a little deflated and confused. And a few consecutive times that this happened, I had a meltdown, which probably looked a little bit more like this. I should say that at this time, I was teaching trainings using business simulations. So before I built my company, I used to be a professional dancer. And as a dancer, I learned how to dance by dancing. Like, let's face it, we're not ever going to learn a skill like dancing sitting on the couch watching So You Think You Can Dance. Just not going to happen. You know when you learn how to ride a bike for the first time? You didn't read the manual on riding the bike. You just got on the bike, right? So when I left that world and started working with athletes, with business leaders, and training them on the psychology of elite performance, it made total sense for me to train them in a way that they were experiencing these skills and not just learning them through case discussions and lectures. Simulations are a great way to train in a safe environment without the risk of making those mistakes that you might do in a crisis situation, a war zone, for example. They're a great standalone in certain environments. Pilots use flight simulators successfully since World War I. Medical students train on patient simulators so they don't go out and endanger a human's life. When I was working with a trapeze artist at Cirque du Soleil where safety is the top priority, well, it made total sense that we use simulation to train them. And it's been used in a multitude of other industries with advances in technology, which had me reflecting and wondering in businesses and industries where employees' lives are not at risk, is adaptation necessary? And so this led me on a path of extensive research. And what I found is that I wasn't the only one experiencing this. I have friends, and they say things like, oh, they're not, just, they're not your audience, or you can't please everyone. But the more and more people that I talk to on the inside I started to realize that this wasn't just my problem. This was a crisis that was being addressed and being faced by corporate world at large. Did you know that 67% of the workforce are disengaged at this time? That's two-thirds of the workforce that are just doing the bare minimum to get by. And a significant percentage of them are just so miserable at work, they are tearing down everything that these engaged people are building, and they are ready to walk out the door, leaving the cash register open. America is at the top of her game. UK, behind, as usual. I can say that because I'm from there, but the sad reality is it's not a joke. This is an ugly downward spiral for everyone. Look at the numbers. Look at Spain, Italy, France at the bottom with 97% disengagement. The numbers are staggering. We add to that that U.S. businesses last year spent $90.6 billion training their people. We know there's a problem. 
but they're relying on the old way of working to train their people and wondering why things aren't happening. The game has changed, ladies and gentlemen. Our data tells us that we, on average, only retain about 25% of new information that we hear. And there are some variations on that, depending on how important the information is to us and so on. But 25% retention is equivalent to $68 billion that was wasted just last year because of poor retention. We are pouring gas into a car that has a hole in the tank. Call it the great training robbery. I wanted to do something about this. And the solution came to me one evening when I was playing a board game with my husband. We're all laughing, we're joking, we're having fun. And at the end of the game, I say to him, so, what did you learn? And so, discussion followed, and we started reflecting on the lessons from the board game and how they connected with his role in the workplace. He was a senior sales executive at the time. And that's when the light bulb went off. This is the missing dynamic in business simulations. We need more fun, more play, more games in the working environment. And so I set off to integrate this. And I started to dig deeper into the mechanics behind games, and I found a surprising statistic. Did you know that the average male gamer is 35 years old? That the average female gamer is 44 years old? These are not your stereotypical kids, unemployed, living in their parents' basement. These are adults in full-time employment with a car and a mortgage. And there are 125 million gamers in America. Here's an interesting thing that I learned about gaming, too. That the designers have built in specific leadership styles that we can take on board that are so relevant to us as leaders. Whether we're a leader of one, just ourselves, or a leader of many, we're learning core principles such as win-win, zero-sum, attrition, ranking. So if we connected the dots, we can now consciously choose how we are going to play and show up in the game of life. And I thought, there's got to be something to this. Turns out there was. Some smart, forward-thinking leaders are now utilizing the exact strategies that game designers are using to hook their players. They're using rewards, badges, rankings, scores, competition, and all these other strategies to hook people to drive engagement, build motivation. It's called gamification. Fitbit did a phenomenal job of engaging their customers, building brand loyalty when they released their app. All of a sudden, runners are getting points for running, for tracking their activity. They're competing against each other to reach the next level of achievement. They're getting badges for hitting the next milestone or crushing their next goal. And now they're encouraged to share their successes on social media, which, of course, has increased Fitbit's brand presence in the marketplace. And I thought, that's what we need to do in the training environment. Get more buzz going, more loyalty, more engagement. And our challenge is that our psychology, and the thing that holds us back is we equate games with fun and frivolous. Good for the gaming world, but not in a work, in a serious environment where we're supposed to be buttoned up. And I want to change that. Give games their rightful place as a driver in learning and retention, engagement, creativity, innovation. But we've disconnected with that side of us, that playful side. Do you remember when you were a kid? I do. I remember when my mom would take me to the park and we, I'd go play in the sandbox. Or if I was with friends, I'd role play doctors, nurses, pirates, princesses. Or my favorite was spinning around like Wonder Woman. As kids, we do that. We naturally engage in games and play. We're creating these make-believe scenarios. As adults, we marvel at kids' creativity. And we wonder how we lost ours. This is the missing piece. And I started to now integrate games and game mechanics into my simulations. I call it gamulation. It's the joining of two words. The word game and the inherent fun and playfulness that comes with it. And the word simulation and the realism associated with it. I'd like to give you an example of a gamulation so that you can see how the two connect together 
and how it can serve you. The gamulation is called the perfect pizza. And it was conceived when I was vacationing in Italy, in Sardinia. I was sitting in a pizza parlor, watching the guy behind the counter. So he's tossing the dough, slapping on the marinara sauce, sprinkling the mozzarella, pizza's going in the oven, and he's repeating this process, like bang, 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 record time. And I'm watching him mesmerized at the speed, and the light goes off. I need to create a gamulation that teaches employees how to build systems for their businesses. They're knocking out pizzas, as many as they can per hour. From this core idea, I started to build this gamulation out, and it had multiple layers. So the theme is, the mayor of Sardinia is telling people of the, of the island that business is booming, he wants more pizza parlors. And so people are getting together in teams and groups, and they allocate a CEO, a CFO, a director of marketing, a director of sales, and so on. And the teams are competing with each other to build the most profitable business. So just like any simulation, any real life, situation, you're going to be learning lessons like leadership, market differentiation, branding, how to collaborate and communicate between departments, what to do when the marketing guy doesn't talk to the sales guy, and how do you deal with that breakdown in communication while still keeping the customers happy, still driving revenue for your business. So just like a real life business, just like a simulation. The difference and what made it a game is the environment that I created. Now it's fun. I've got music, Italian music playing. People are transported to Italy as soon as they walk into the room. The decor, the role play, the costumes. I show up as the mayor of Sardinia, demanding accountability from people, negotiating their contracts, but people are having fun. We're bringing in pizza from the outside, from the local pizza place, and people are in this environment where they feel safe enough to take risks make decisions that they wouldn't normally do when they're selling their widget in the workplace. If they're in their boardroom and they're discussing the next strategy or the next move, they need to know what they're doing. They need to know what they're talking about, and they're not going to take those kinds of risks. But when you're making pizza and you're in the simulated, gamified, gamulated environment, why not? And so now they're learning things. They're pushing the boundaries of what they're capable of, and they're excited to walk out there and test all this new cool stuff they've learned. So I've been following and tracking over 200 trainees over the last two years, and here's what I found. The engagement level was at 90% in the room. That's almost triple the engagement rate in America right now. The retention level within just a week was at 80%. You compare that 80% to the 25, which is our average for traditional classroom style learning, and we can see the transformation that happened. But here's what's really exciting. Remember that $68 billion that we talked about that was potentially wasted because of poor retention last year? Imagine if $54 billion of that could have been saved just by using gamulation as a training tool. What could that do for the landscape in corporate America or for the world? If you're wondering how you can implement this, I want to share, I've developed about 45 gamulations over the last couple of years, that there are three core elements that you need, and you need all three. The first is you've got to be relevant. The gamulation has to be relevant to the problem that you want to solve. Two, the realism. It's got to resemble some kind of business environment that you are likely to experience. And three, the reward. There's got to be some built-in reward that is engaging, that is motivating people to say, yes, I want to be a part of this. And when you have all three, not just one or two, but all three, you've got people in the palm of your hand. I want to leave you with this. I profoundly believe that investing in our learning and our development is going to be key for us to be able to step into the roles of tomorrow. But the learning has got to be done the right way. When we enter that sweet spot that is gamulation, now we're driving engagement, we're stimulating creativity, we're firing up our ability to think outside the box. And these are core business needs for today and tomorrow's leaders. When I found in my training that I started using gamulation, I pretty much eliminated those glazed eyeballs 
whether people gravitated towards the realism of a simulation or they loved the playfulness inherent in games. I had them all. Employees were happy, businesses were happy, and I felt pretty good that I enabled people to connect with their inner child. So I invite you to embrace gamulation as the future of training and to share this with others, particularly those that are familiar with that glazed eye syndrome. Thank you.